Here's an essay by Montaigne translated by Donald M. Frame. It's called Of Practice. Reasoning and education, though we are willing to put our trust in them, can hardly be powerful enough to lead us to action unless besides we exercise and form our soul by experience to the way we want it to go. Otherwise, when it comes to the time for action, it will undoubtedly find itself at a loss. That is why, among the philosophers, those who have wanted to attain some greater excellence have not been content to await the rigors of fortune in shelter and repose, for fear she might surprise them inexperienced and new to the combat. Rather, they have gone forth to meet her and flung themselves deliberately into the test of difficulties. Some of them have abandoned riches to exercise themselves in a voluntary poverty. Others have sought labor and a painful austerity of life to toughen themselves against toil and trouble. Others have deprived themselves of the most precious parts of the body, such as sight and the organs of generation, for fear that their services, too pleasant and easy, might relax and soften the firmness of their soul. But for dying, which is the greatest task we have to perform, practice cannot help us. A man can, by habit and experience, fortify himself against pain, shame, indigence, and such other accidents. But as for death, we can try it only once. We are all apprentices when we come to it. In ancient times there were men who husbanded their time so excellently that they tried to taste and savor it even at the point of death, and strained their minds to see what this passage was. But they have not come back to tell us news of it. No man awakes whom once the icy end of living overtakes. Lucretius Ah, oh, I just realized I don't know the right way to pronounce this name. Canius Julius? Canius Julius, a Roman nobleman of singular virtue and firmness, after being condemned to death by that scoundrel Caligula, gave this among many prodigious proofs of his resoluteness. As he was on the point of being executed, a philosopher friend of his asked him, Well, Canius, how stands your soul at this moment? What is it doing? What are your thoughts? I was thinking, he replied, about holding myself ready and with all my powers intent to see whether in that instant of death, so short and brief, I shall be able to perceive any dislodgment of the soul, and whether it will have any feeling of its departure, so that if I learn anything about it, I may return later, if I can, to give the information to my friends. This man philosophizes not only unto death, but even in death itself. What assurance it was, and what proud courage, to want his death to serve as a lesson to him, and to have leisure to think about other things in such a great business. Such sway he had over his dying soul. That's a quote from Lucan. It seems to me, however, that there is a certain way of familiarizing ourselves with death, and trying it out to some extent. We can have an experience of it that is, if not entire and perfect, at least not useless, and that makes us more fortified and assured. If we cannot reach it, we can approach it, we can reconnoiter it, and if we do not penetrate as far as its fort, at least we shall see and become acquainted with the approaches to it. It is not without reason that we are taught to study even our sleep for the resemblance it has with death. How easily we pass from waking to sleeping. With how little sense of loss we lose consciousness of the light and of ourselves. Perhaps the faculty of sleep, which deprives us of all action and all feeling, might seem useless and contrary to nature, were it not that thereby nature teaches us that she has made us for dying and living alike, and from the start of life presents to us the eternal state that she reserves for us after we die, to accustom us to it and take away our fear of it. 
but those who by some violent accident have fallen into a faint and lost all sensation. Those, in my opinion, have been very close to seeing death's true and natural face. For as to the instant and point of passing away, it is not to be feared that it carries with it any travail or pain, since we can have no feeling without leisure. Our sufferings need time, which in death is so short and precipitate that it must necessarily be imperceptible. It is the approaches that we have to fear, and these may fall within our experience. Many things seem to us greater in imagination than in reality. I have spent a good part of my life in perfect and entire health. I mean not merely entire, but even blithe and ebullient. This state, full of verdure and cheer, made me find the thought of illnesses so horrible that when I came to experience them, I found their pains mild and easy compared with my fears. Here is what I experience every day. If I am warmly sheltered in a nice room during a stormy and tempestuous night, I am appalled and distressed for those who are then in the open country. If I am myself outside, I do not even wish to be anywhere else. The mere idea of being always shut up in a room seemed to me unbearable. Suddenly I had to get used to being there a week or a month full of agitation, alteration, and weakness. And I have found that in time of health I used to pity the sick much more than I now think I deserve to be pitied when I am sick myself, and that the power of my apprehension made its object appear almost half again as fearful as it was in its truth and essence. I hope that the same thing will happen to me with death, and that it is not worth the trouble I take, the many preparations that I make, and all the many aids that I invoke and assemble to sustain the shock of it. But at all events, we can never be well enough prepared. During our third civil war, or the second, I do not quite remember which, I went riding one day about a league from my house, which is situated at the very hub of all the turmoil of the civil wars of France, Thinking myself perfectly safe, and so near my home that I needed no better equipage, I took a very easy but not very strong horse. On my return, when a sudden occasion came up for me to use this horse for a service to which it was not accustomed, one of my men, big and strong, riding a powerful workhorse who had a desperately hard mouth and was moreover fresh and vigorous, this man, in order to show his daring and get ahead of his companions, spurred his horse at full speed up the path behind me, came down like a colossus on the little man and little horse, and hit us like a thunderbolt with all his strength and weight, sending us both head over heels, so that there lay the horse bowled over and stunned, and I, ten or twelve paces beyond, dead, stretched on my back, my face all bruised and skinned, my sword, which I had had in my hand, more than ten paces away, my belt in pieces, having no more motion or feeling than a log. It is the only swoon that I have experienced to this day. Those who were with me, after having tried all the means they could to bring me round, thinking me dead, took me in their arms and were carrying me with great difficulty to my house, which was about half a French league from there. On the way, and after I had been taken for dead for more than two full hours, I began to move and breathe, for so great an abundance of blood had fallen into my stomach that nature had to revive its forces to discharge it. They set me up on my feet, where I threw up a whole bucketful of clots of pure blood, and several times on the way I had to do the same thing. In so doing, I began to recover a little life, but it was bit by bit and over so long a stretch of time that my first feelings were much closer to death than to life because the shaken soul, uncertain yet of its return, is still not firmly set. That's a quote from Tasso. Mm -hmm. This recollection, which is strongly implanted on my soul, showing me the face and idea of death so true to nature, reconciles me to it somewhat. When I began to see anything, it was with a vision so blurred, weak, and dead, that I still could distinguish nothing but the light, as one twixt wakefulness and doze, whose eyes now open, now again they close. That's Tasso again. As for the functions of the soul, they were reviving with the same progress as those of the body. 
I saw myself all bloody, for my doublet was stained all over with the blood I had thrown up. The first thought that came to me was that I had gotten a harquebus shot in the head. Indeed, several were being fired around us at the time of the accident. It seemed to me that my life was hanging only by the tip of my lips. I closed my eyes in order, it seemed to me, to help push it out, and took pleasure in growing languid and letting myself go. It was an idea that was only floating on the surface of my soul, as delicate and feeble as all the rest, but in truth not only free from distress, but mingled with that sweet feeling that people have who let themselves slide into sleep. I believe that this is the same state in which people find themselves, whom we see fainting with weakness in the agony of death. And I maintain that we pity them without cause, supposing that they are agitated by grievous pains, or have their soul oppressed by painful thoughts. This has always been my view, against the opinion of many, and even, and even of Etienne, uh, oh, damn it, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name right, and even of Etienne de la Boétie, concerning those whom we see thus prostrate and comatose as their end approaches, or overwhelmed by the length of the disease, or by a stroke of apoplexy, or by epilepsy. This we do often see, a man struck as by lightning, by some malady, falls down all foaming at the mouth, shivers and rants. He moans under the torture, writhes his muscles, pants, and in fitful tossing exhausts his weary limbs. That's Lucretius. Or wounded in the head. When we hear them groan and from time to time utter poignant sighs, or see them make certain movements of the body, we seem to see signs that they still have some consciousness left. But I have always thought, I say, that their soul and body were buried in sleep. He lives and is unconscious of his life. That's Ovid. And I could not believe that with so great a paralysis of the limbs, and so great a failing of the senses, a soul could maintain any force within by which to be conscious of itself. And so I believed that they had no reflections to torment them, nothing able to make them judge and feel the misery of their condition, and that consequently they were not much to be pitied. I can imagine no state so horrible and unbearable for me as to have my soul alive and afflicted without means to express itself. I should say the same of those who are sent to execution with their tongue cut out, were it not that in this sort of death the most silent seems to be the most becoming, if it goes with a firm, grave countenance, and the same of those miserable prisoners who fall into the hands of the villainous murdering soldiers of these days, who torture them with every kind of cruel treatment to force them to pay some excessive and impossible ransom, keeping them meanwhile in a condition and in a place where they have no means whatever of expressing or signifying their thoughts and their misery. The poets have portrayed some gods as favorable to the deliverance of those who thus drag out a lingering death. I bear to Pluto by decree this lock of hair, and from your body set you free. Virgil. Nonetheless, the short and incoherent words and replies that are extorted from them by dint of shouting about their ears and storming at them, or the movements that seem to have some connection with what is asked them, are not evidence that they are alive, at least fully alive. So it happens to us in the early stages of sleep, before it has seized us completely, to sense as in a dream what is happening around us, and to follow voices with a blurred and uncertain hearing, which seems to touch on only the edges of the soul, and following the last words spoken to us, we make answers that are more random than sensible. Now I have no doubt, now that I have tried this out by experience, that I judged this matter rightly all along. For from the first, while wholly unconscious, I was laboring to rip open my doublet with my nails, for I was not in armor, and yet I know that I felt nothing in my imagination that hurt me, for there are many movements of ours that do not come from our will. And half-dead fingers writhe and seize the sword again. That's a quote from Virgil. Thus those who are falling throw out their arms in front of them by a natural impulse which makes our limbs lend each other their services and have stirrings apart from our reason. They say that chariots bearing scythes will cut so fast that severed limbs are writhing on the ground below 
before the victim's soul and strength can ever know or even feel the pain, so swift has been the hurt. Lucretius My stomach was oppressed with the clotted blood. My hands flew to it of their own accord, as they often do where we itch against the intention of our will. There are many animals, and even men, whose muscles we can see contract and move after they are dead. Every man knows by experience that there are parts that often move, stand up, and lie down without his leave. Now these passions which touch only the rind of us cannot be called ours. To make them ours, the whole man must be involved, and the pains which the foot or the hand feel while we are asleep are not ours. As I approached my house, where the alarm of my fall had already come, and the members of my family had met me with the outcries customary in such cases, not only did I make some sort of answer to what was asked me, but also, they say, I thought of ordering them to give a horse to my wife, whom I saw stumbling and having trouble on the road, which is steep and rugged. It would seem that this consideration must have proceeded from a wide-awake soul, yet the fact is that I was not there at all. These were idle thoughts in the clouds set in motion by the sensations of the eyes and ears. They did not come from within me. I did not know for all that where I was coming from or where I was going, nor could I weigh and consider what I was asked. These are slight effects which the senses produce of themselves, as if by habit. What the soul contributed was in a dream, touched very lightly, and merely licked and sprinkled, as it were, by the soft impression of the senses. Meanwhile my condition was, in truth, very pleasant and peaceful. I felt no affliction either for others or for myself. It was a languor and an extreme weakness, without any pain. I saw my house without recognizing it. When they had put me to bed, I felt infinite sweetness in this repose, for I had been villainously yanked about by those poor fellows who had taken the pains to carry me in their arms over a long and very bad road, and had tired themselves out two or three times in relays. They offered me many remedies, of which I accepted none, holding it for certain that I was mortally wounded in the head. It would, in truth, have been a very happy death, for the weakness of my understanding kept me from having any judgment of it, and that of my body from having any feeling of it. I was letting myself slip away so gently, so gradually and easily, that I hardly ever did anything with less of a feeling of effort. When I came back to life and regained my powers, when my senses at last regained their strength, that's a quote from Ovid, which was two or three hours later, I felt myself all of a sudden caught up again in the pains, my limbs being all battered and bruised by my fall, and I felt so bad two or three nights after that I thought I was going to die all over again, but by a more painful death, and I still feel the effect of the shock of that collision. I do not want to forget this, that the last thing I was able to recover was the memory of this accident. I had people repeat to me several times where I was going, where I was coming from, at what time it had happened to me, before I could take it in. As for the manner of my fall, they concealed it from me and made up other versions for the sake of the man who had been the cause of it. But a long time after, and the next day, when my memory came to open up and picture to me the state I had been in at the instant I had perceived that horse bearing down on me, for I had seen him at my heels and thought I was a dead man, but that thought had been so sudden that I had no time to be afraid, it seemed to me that a flash of lightning was striking my soul with a violent shock, and that I was coming back from the other world. This account of so trivial an event would be rather pointless were it not for the instruction that I have derived from it for myself. For in truth, in order to get used to the idea of death, I find there is nothing like coming close to it. Now, as Pliny says, each man is a good education to himself, provided he has the capacity to spy on himself from close up. What I write here is not my teaching, but my study. It is not a lesson for others, but for me. And yet it should not be held against me if I publish what I write. What is useful to me may also by accident be useful to another. Moreover, I am not spoiling anything. I am using only what is mine. And if I play the fool, it is at my expense and without harm to anyone. For it is a folly that will die with me and will have no consequences. We have heard of only two or three ancients who opened up this road 
and even of them we cannot say whether their manner in the least resembled mine, since we know only their names. No one since has followed their lead. It is a thorny undertaking, and more so than it seems, to follow a movement so wandering as that of our mind, to penetrate the opaque depths of its innermost folds, to pick out and immobilize the innumerable flutterings that agitate it. And it is a new and extraordinary amusement which withdraws us from the ordinary occupations of the world, yes, even from those most recommended. It is many years now that I have had only myself as object of my thoughts, that I have been examining and studying only myself, and if I study anything else it is in order promptly to apply it to myself, or rather within myself. And it does not seem to me that I am making a mistake if, as is done in the other sciences, which are incomparably less useful, I impart what I have learned in this one, though I am hardly satisfied with the progress I have made in it. There is no description equal in difficulty, or certainly in usefulness, to the description of oneself. Even so, one must spruce up. Even so, one must present oneself in an orderly arrangement, if one would go out in public. Now I am constantly adorning myself, for I am constantly describing myself. Custom has made speaking of oneself a vice, and obstinately forbids it out of hatred for the boasting that seems always to accompany it. Instead of blowing the child's nose as we should, this amounts to pulling it off. Flight from a fault will lead us into crime. That's Horace. I find more harm than good in this remedy. But even if it were true that it is presumptuous, no matter what the circumstances, to talk to the public about oneself, I still must not, according to my general plan, refrain from an action that openly displays this morbid quality, since it is in me, nor may I conceal this fault which I not only practice but profess. However, to say what I think about it, custom is wrong to condemn wine because many get drunk on it. We can misuse only things which are good and I believe that the rule against speaking of oneself applies only to the vulgar form of this failing. Such rules are bridles for calves, with which neither the saints, whom we hear speaking so boldly about themselves, nor the philosophers, nor the theologians, curb themselves. Nor do I, though I am none of these. If they do not write about themselves expressly, at least when the occasion leads them to it, they do not hesitate to put themselves prominently on display. What does Socrates treat of more fully than himself? To what does he lead his disciples' conversation more often than to talk about themselves, not about the lesson of their book, but about the essence and movement of their soul? We speak our thoughts religiously to God and to our confessor, as our neighbors do to the whole people. But, someone will answer, we speak only our self-accusations. Then we speak everything for our very virtue is faulty and fit for repentance. My trade and my art is living. He who forbids me to speak about it according to my sense, experience, and practice, let him order the architect to speak of buildings not according to himself but according to his neighbor, according to another man's knowledge not according to his own. If it is vainglory for a man himself to publish his own merits, why doesn't Cicero proclaim the eloquence of Hortentius, Hortentius that of Cicero? Perhaps they mean that I should testify about myself by works and deeds, not by bare words. What I chiefly portray is my cogitations, a shapeless subject that does not lend itself to expression in actions. It is all I can do to couch my thoughts in this airy medium of words. Some of the wisest and most devout men have lived avoiding all noticeable actions. My actions would tell more about fortune than about me. They bear witness to their own part, not to mine, unless it be by conjecture and without certainty. They are samples which display only details. I expose myself entire. My portrait is a cadaver on which the veins, the muscles, and the tendons appear at a glance, each part in its place. One part of what I am was produced by a cough, another by a pallor or a palpitation of the heart, in any case dubiously. It is not my deeds that I write down, it is myself, it is my essence. I hold that a man should be cautious in making an estimate of himself, and equally conscientious in testifying about himself, 
whether he rates himself high or low, makes no difference. If I seemed to myself good and wise, or nearly so, I would shout it out at the top of my voice. To say less of yourself than is true is stupidity, not modesty. To pay yourself less than you are worth is cowardice and pusillanimity, according to Aristotle. No virtue is helped by falsehood, and truth is never subject to error. To say more of yourself than is true is not always presumption. It too is often stupidity. To be immoderately pleased with what you are, to fall therefore into an undiscerning self-love, is in my opinion the substance of this vice. The supreme remedy to cure it is to do just the opposite of what those people prescribe, who by prohibiting talking about oneself, even more strongly prohibit thinking about oneself. The pride lies in the thought. The tongue can have only a very slight share in it. It seems to them that to be occupied with oneself means to be pleased with oneself, that to frequent and associate with oneself means to cherish oneself too much. That may be, but this excess arises only in those who touch themselves no more than superficially, who observe themselves only after taking care of their business, who call it daydreaming and idleness to be concerned with oneself, and making castles in Spain to furnish and build oneself, who think themselves something alien and foreign to themselves. If anyone gets intoxicated with his knowledge when he looks beneath him, let him turn his eyes upward toward past ages, and he will lower his horns, finding there so many thousands of minds that trample him underfoot. If he gets into some flattering presumption about his valor, let him remember the lives of the two Scipios, so many armies, so many nations, all of whom leave him so far behind them. No particular quality will make a man proud who balances it against the many weaknesses and imperfections that are also in him, and in the end against the nullity of man's estate. Because Socrates alone had seriously digested the precept of his God, to know himself, and because by that study he had come to despise himself, he alone was deemed worthy of the name wise. Whoever knows himself thus, let him boldly make himself known by his own mouth.